Alamut by Vladimir Bartol, a little-known Slovenian work which actually served as the main source of inspiration for the Assassin's Creed video games, or at least the first one, anyhow. Um, you'll have to forgive me if I come across a little stuffy and or sniffly. I'm just coming off one of the worst colds I have ever had in my life, but uh, bear with me. Anyway, this book, Alamut by Vladimir Bartol, is a historical slash philosophical novel, which can be a little bit difficult to expound upon contextually, I guess, because the history which this book is based around is probably not going to be very well known to, to uh, most Western readers. Uh, this is the story of Hassan ibn Sabah, who was the leader of the Hashashin, or what we would later denote as the Order of Assassins, hence the Assassin's Creed connection. Anyway, this book takes place in like uh, 1,000-something, very old history, um, and it follows uh, Hassan's rise to power uh, and the ascent of the Ismaili order to supremacy in Iran, ancient Iran. Um, if you don't know what the Ismaili doctrine is, that is a branch of Islam, much like uh, the Sunnis, uh, which they were uh, in direct competition with, I believe. Uh, but you don't actually need to know all that much about that history to uh, enjoy this book because A, this book is incredibly well researched and it actually provides um, a great uh, window onto those events uh, just in itself. Um, and also this book can be appreciated just as a work of uh, fiction, and a work of philosophical fiction at that because this book definitely is a thoughtful work and one that it was kind of eerily prescient in many ways, I believe. All right, so I mean, if you don't know who Hassan ibn Sabah was, he was, like I said, the leader of the Ismaili faction of um, Islam in the ancient world of Iran, and uh, he was noted for creating the order of Hashashin, or the assassins, um, and he did so very interestingly. So, he uh, promulgated a rumor that he had been given by Allah himself the key that unlocked the gates of paradise, that he could send his followers to heaven and bring them back at will. And the way that he accomplished this was by creating a lush garden which resembled what the Quran said that the afterlife would resemble to the faithful, and he populated it with some fine-ass honeys, uh, which were meant to impersonate the Uri, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Auri, Uri, uh, basically the, the 72 virgins, you know, that, uh, the, that those who fall in battle for the true faith will achieve in the hereafter, and he would dope his followers with hashish, uh, which I believe that the word uh, assassin is actually uh, come, it actually comes, I think, from the word hashish, but, uh, because the original order which Hassan created was called the order of hashashin, which is from the word hashish. Uh, but anyway, he would dope them with hash, and then when they woke up, he would I mean, they would find themselves in these gardens which he had prepared, um, and they would find themselves um, doted on by lots of luscious beauties, and they would subsequently think that he that he was actually transporting them to um, heaven, to paradise, and then whenever he would knock them out again and bring them back to where they were, they were utterly devoted to him, heart and soul. And so... The Order of Assassins was able to achieve a level of great renown in the ancient world because they were uh, fanatical, utterly. Uh, they were suicidally fanatical, in fact. And this is where the book kind of uh, points out some very prescient things about our world today. But our three main characters in this book, because this book has more or less three main characters, are Hassan himself, um, and his schemings and Machiavellian ploys to craft the perfect soldier 
who can be used to bring about this empire which he is striving to create. And then we have Ibn Tahir, who is a young, a teenage child soldier who has been brought to the fortress of Alamut, because that's what the title means. Alamut was the stronghold of the Ismailis in ancient Iran um, and the base of operations for Hassan. And he has come to Alamut to devote himself to the cause and fight in Hassan's army. And then we have the young girl, Halima, who is a young slave girl who has been purchased by Hassan to be one of his Uri or Auri. I don't know how to pronounce half these words uh, because, you know, they're all Middle Eastern and what have you. Um, and uh, their paths cross in some interesting ways. Um, and this book is very, very slowly paced. And in fact, that would be one of my main criticisms with this book. Uh, but such as it is, uh, Ibn Tahir comes to Alamut to be a soldier. Uh, Halima is brought to Alamut to be um, basically pimped out for these uh, soldiers called the Fedayeen, the Fedayeen, Fedayeen, however they're pronounced, the elite, which uh, are the ones who Hassan is purporting to send into paradise and retract. Um, and then Hassan, who is overseeing all of this. Now, that's just kind of the broad strokes of the plot. But, but let's dig into what the meat of this book really is about. Uh, this book is a pretty good uh, breakdown of kind of um, the essence of faith and devotion and the fine line between faith and fanaticism and how that can be exploited to get people to do some really uh, bad things. However, I would like to point out this book is a work of literature that is 100% amoral. And I've said it before that sometimes literature uh, functions the best when it is amoral, when it does not cast judgments on what it depicts, but rather allows the reader to come to their own conclusions. Because the, the actions which Hassan um, perpetrates in this book are absolutely reprehensible. He uses people like puppets. Um, people are just literally nothing but meat to him that he will use to further himself and achieve his ends. Uh, but as despicable as that sounds, dang if you don't kind of root for the guy over the course of this book because he is so ingenious in his in his scheming. Uh, so uh, Hassan, the character of Hassan is really the strong point of this book. Um, he is depicted not as a faithful Muslim like the majority of the other characters, but rather a godless atheist who is kind of uh, depicted as the, the post-God Nietzschean ubermensch, kind of. In fact, I believe that Friedrich Nietzsche was one of Bartol's uh, primary sources of inspiration when writing this book, and I am pretty 99% sure that is the case because this book's motto, which is the, the which is the given as the uh, motto of the Ismaili doctrine in this book, is the phrase "Nothing is true, everything is permitted." Which, if you played the Assassin's Creed games, you'll know that is the Assassin's Creed. That is literally the creed of the assassins. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Um, and uh, while this book is where that phrase became famous, if you read Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, as I did last year, you will find that exact same phrase verbatim in that book. So while this book may be the one that is credited with popularizing the phrase, nothing is true, everything is permitted, and subsequently lending it to uh, the Assassin's Creed video games. It actually comes from Nietzsche, I believe. But anyway, um, Hassan is not really a Muslim at all. He has gone beyond religion. He realizes that, as the the motto says, nothing is true, everything is permitted. He realizes that religion um, is kind of just a tool, you know, like the old Marxist uh, motto, um, opium, of the mass, opium of the masses. I mean, he realizes that people uh, don't really want the truth because the truth is 
more horrifying uh, than the comfort which they receive from uh, re the religions which they follow, and that truth is that nothing is true and everything is permitted. And so, um, as the kind of Nietzschean Ubermensch that he is depicted as, Hassan uh, is beyond the uh, thrall of religion, and so he subsequently uses it to manipulate the other characters in the book uh, to do what he wants them to do. Um, and this book is replete with lots of introspective moments and kind of uh, contemplative instances about the nature of reality and how our senses uh, play into that and how nothing can really be verified except by our senses. Uh, and so these young men that he is sending into these gardens to be charmed and seduced by these uh, young women, he's saying that basically to them it really is no different than being in actual paradise because they don't know the difference. And so uh, because they think they have been to paradise and that he has the ability to send them to paradise, they will die for him at a moment's notice. Um, and this creates the perfect soldier, one who will sacrifice everything without any kind of consideration or thought at all. And in that regard, uh, this book is, as I said, quite prescient because, you know, we live in a world uh, today which uh, we see, you know, lots of examples of Islamic radicalism in the news and everything, you know, like 9-11. Um, and... Uh, this book does an excellent job of getting inside that mindset and showing how that is, how that can come to be, how a human being can be led to the point where they will destroy themselves completely uh, for a, a conjectured reward um, in the hereafter. Uh, I believe on the back of this book here, it says a direct quote, um, if Osama bin Laden did not exist, Vladimir Bartol would have invented him because Osama bin Laden was kind of uh, like, you know, our world's version of Hassan ibn Sabah because he got lots of young men to kill themselves and a lot of other people as well uh, for a reward that he promised they would receive later on in the afterlife. Uh, and this book is such a valuable work because it's so eloquently demonstrates how a person can be led to that point, but it does not actually condemn those who do the leading. And that is, again, one of this book's strong points is that it is completely amoral. It does not tell you one way or the other how you should view Hassan's actions because um, playing into the Nietzschean aspect of this, um, if you're dumb enough to be a sucker like that, then you basically deserve whatever shit you get. And that's Hassan's position that he's like, these people don't want the truth. They don't want um, the, the, to know the true nature of the world in which they dwell. They just want the, the, the comfort of their religion. And I'm going to give it to them, but I'm also going to make sure that I get something out of the deal. Because if they are willing to be deluded, then I am damn sure going to delude them, but I'm going to make a serious uh, stake in the world by doing it. I'm going to use them for my benefit because that's basically all they deserve because they will not open their eyes and they have not reached the same level of awareness that I have. Um, and again, that sounds despicable and it, and it is despicable basically, but as ingenious as Hassan really is in this book, you kind of you kind of get behind him more than you'd like to, probably. Now, uh, let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of this book on a literary level. Um, the characters in this book are actually really good. Again, we have three principal characters. Hassan himself, who is definitely the most complex and memorable character in the work. Then we have Ibn Tahir and Halima. And all these characters are rendered pretty well um, in in a, uh, a fair amount of dimensions. Um, and when these characters ultimately meet the fates that they do in this book, it kind of does elicit certain reactions from the reader whenever that transpires. Uh, because some uh, some characters whom we have grown close to over the, the, the course of the story 
uh, eventually are killed off very callously, I might say, by Hassan, because remember, the purpose of these uh, young men are to carry out his orders like that and to die at, at the drop of a hat, which they do. And it can be really shocking and kind of affecting whenever um, they die for nothing, as we know as the reader, that they're just dying for nothing. Uh, but the characters are pretty good. Imante here is actually a pretty good character because he is devoted, but he also has a degree of skepticism uh, that kind of makes him a little bit smarter than the rest of his cohorts and kind of, in the end, puts him in the good graces of Hassan because uh, Hassan sees a lot of himself in Ibn Tahir. And there's also a character in here named Miriam, who is a really great character because she is kind of the female counterpart to Hassan. She has lost faith in everything because she originally started out a Christian. Uh, then she kind of uh, was brought into the Muslim world, and now she's just like Hassan. She's beyond all of that. She doesn't really believe in anything. Um, but the way her story concludes in this is honestly kind of heartbreaking, actually, and it shows the ramifications that this ideology of Hassan's has on the people around him and how only the strongest of the strong can really live the way that he's living, To can really live and treat people this callously and, you know, still go on because the way that the characters in this book are treated is utterly deplorable. Uh, but again, it's amoral and doesn't comment one way or the other on that. Now, the writing in this book is really good, too. It's, it's written in a fairly simplistic style, but it lends itself well to this. Uh, he wasn't going now obviously this is a translation i don't i don't speak slovenian uh but bartol was obviously going for a pretty uh no frills approach to the writing but it's it it gets the job done and it's not clumsy and it's very concise that's that's the main thing about the writing in this book it's very concise he never repeats himself. He never goes over anything twice. It's very to the point, and I liked it. It, it worked well with this. Um, uh, and um, a little bit. Let's talk about the my complaints with the book because I did have some complaints, and that mainly had to do with the pacing of the story. Uh, first of all, this book is relatively lengthy. This edition is three hundred and seventy-seven pages. And honestly, I don't think it needed to be that long. Uh, this book is, frankly, very, very boring for long stretches of this book. In fact, two-thirds of this book are really just tedious as hell. Only in the last third of this book do things really start to come alive and do things really start to happen that have any degree of impact on the reader. Uh, the first two-thirds of the book are set up, and it went on longer than I thought it needed to because the it sets itself up as something of a mystery. It presumes that uh, you, the reader, will not be aware and will not have much, not much, if any, knowledge about the history which the book is playing with. And so it sets itself up as kind of a mystery as all these... Um, lovely young women are being uh, installed in this luscious garden to uh, uh, to portray otherworldly figures and you're kind of like what what is going on here why is that happening and then when Ibn Tahir gets to Alamut and it's explained that Hassan has the key to paradise and he can send any of them that he wants to paradise and bring them back um, then you kind of get where that's where it's going and where it's going to lead, uh, but it it was too much setup. That was my main complaint with this book. It was far too much setup, and the payoff uh, was not really in proportion to what it demanded of you getting to that point. And also, it had far too much falling action. The climax of the book takes place about. 50 or 40 or so pages before the book actually ends, and it, it just climaxed too early, and those last few chapters were really just a drag because all interest had fled at that point because you had seen 
all that the book was really going to give you. And so it would just kind of drug on and on just a little bit. Uh, but overall, to rate uh, Vladimir Bartol's Alamut, I would give this book a solid B+. It is definitely a high-quality work and one that has kind of fallen by the wayside over the years. And I think not a lot of people are really aware of this book, I don't think. Uh, and that's kind of a shame because this book definitely does have a lot to say. And it uh, has a great deal of pertinence to our world today. Uh, because so much of what is depicted in this book has carried over kind of in certain manners into our world contemporarily. And uh, this book is definitely valuable because of that. So, yeah, I, I would give uh, Alamut a good solid B+. Plus. It is definitely a quality work that maybe could have been structured a little bit better, definitely drug on a little bit longer than they needed to. Uh, but the characters are good and the writing is uh, good. And uh, the philosophy at the heart of the book uh, really will make you think. And again, the amoral nature of it uh, scored at major points in my esteem because I like it when books just leave it up to the reader uh, to determine how, what they make of the events which they depict. So yeah, Alamut B plus work. So Alamut by Vladimir Bartol. Have you read Alamut? If you have, let me know down in the comments what you thought about it, whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything I've said about it here today. If you have not read Alamut, I could recommend this. Um, the Again, the history that is based around is probably going to be uh, pretty foreign to most readers in the Western world because one, it's ancient. It's over a thousand years in the past. And two, it's um, Iranian history. It's a very, uh, um, you know, it, it's from the Middle East. And I'm, I'm aware that a lot of Western audiences may not really be aware of the history of those areas so much. Uh, but like I said, you don't need to know all that much about it going into this book because it, it does a great job of laying it out there as the story goes. And yeah, it's just a pretty good book. Uh, so I could definitely recommend it. And as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And until next time, peace.